here at the Age Management Medicine Conference in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I have the distinct pleasure of speaking to Dr. Morali Prahalad, who's CEO and President of Epic Science. And they're doing major innovative work in looking at ways that we can begin to explore treating, diagnosing, and detecting cancer way before it becomes a problem. And as the cancer metastasizes, how to stop it in its tracks in ways never heard of before. Dr. Morali Prahalad, welcome. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, well, I'd love to learn more, and I'd love our audience to also hear more about why is cancer so hard to treat despite all the advances and even diagnose? What do we understand now about this disease? I think what we're really learning as we look at some of these new technologies, particularly in the liquid biopsy front, is that actually cancer is not a singular homogeneous disease. Right? It's actually a composition of multiple different cell types that are occurring simultaneously in these patients. So while our biological understanding of the disease has actually increased and the targeted therapies now are coming out are efficacious, they're actually killing a particular subset of cells in the patient's body, but then there are other cell types that actually just grow back to replace them. And so it's really understanding that diversity of cells in a patient that's going to become paramount to getting ahead of the, the disease and actually assigning drugs in, in a combination therapy, uh, but more importantly in a rational way that actually meets a patient's disease at a particular point. So basically what you're saying is that cancer itself um, mor morphs in ways that are all different. And because of those changes in the cells themselves and the very DNA mm -hmm. they express, we need to come up with innovative ways to tackle them because they actually alter their course as they yeah. continue. In the exactly. And I think what we're trying to find out is whether that, that these cells always exist in a patient and then by actually throwing out each of these lines of therapy sequentially, are we selecting for different subsets and that's what emerges? Or is it that the cells themselves are morphing and mutating in response to the drug? I think we're going to find out more about this over time. But what's very clear is that we are dealing with different cell populations that are quite distinct and, and I think are displaying a range of attributes that we never knew possible. And how do you detect these different cell compositions? I understand that Epic Sciences has a unique way of looking at circulating tumor cells. Can you tell us a little bit about it and also liquid biopsies? Yeah, so liquid biopsies are a very interesting term, right? They refer to a broad range of technologies. Looking at circulating tumor cells is one approach. The other is to look at circulating DNA in the, in the blood that can come from actually natural cell, uh, normal cells that have died or cancer cells as well. But the idea is there you look at, at different uh, changes in the DNA that you find in the blood. We focus on the cell because we think it's the most active unit of metastatic biology. And the way we do it is we actually can put all of the nucleated cells on a slide and then actually use an interesting combination of staining and computation to identify cancer from normal. And in that process, because we've not had any type of bias in the types of cells we're looking for, we're finding there's a far broader range of these cells that actually exist than previously thought. Interesting. And these are circulating tumor cells. How can they help us both detect and treat disease and make decisions at the time when can the cancer doesn't seem to be responding to any kind of intervention or the conventional medicine approach as opposed to a more precision medicine approach? No, that's a great question. I think the way they can help us really is to start to first say, what is the, the, the range of bad actors really present? And then within each of these cells, what is the range and clustering of genetic mutations they actually harbor? And that'll allow us to figure out which drug or drugs will actually likely work for this patient. What we have today is a series of, of guidelines that actually speak to the broader population average versus an individual patient in specific. So by being able to monitor these cell populations at different points in time, even in the context of a singular patient, will allow us to see how the disease is morphing in real time. And then ideally make changes in the course of therapy uh, well in advance of, of, of downstream progression. Fascinating. So going back to the original biopsy when we first diagnosed cancer, whether it's in the prostate or lung or breast, is not always the best way to detect what's happening to the cancer in a person's body. Absolutely, because when it gets particularly to the later stage of the disease, the cancer has now withstood multiple rounds of therapeutic assault. And as a result, the cells that survive and progress beyond look quite different 
than the original cells. In some instances, they may have the primary driver mutations that were there at the very inception, but in many cases, they actually don't. And what we're finding is cancer actually is, is probably taking two distinct types, some that are more truncal mutations, where there's very predominant changes that happen at the beginning of the disease, and then you get variants in the theme, and some cancers which are much more chaotic, where the mutational profile is really all over the map. And each of those have to be handled probably in di very different kinds of ways. And what I understood from your very enlightening lecture is that these morphing cancer cells that then metastasize elsewhere in the body, whether it's bone or brain or liver, actually take on almost a resistance form. They may not respond to the same therapy. So that in effect we're almost uh, seeing the same patterns you see with antibiotic use where you may be selecting for cells that are so resistant they're going to start populating and drive the cancer in the wrong direction. Absolutely and I think really uh, the analogy we love to draw is that of HIV where the drugs that were the target antiretrovirals actually worked. They hit subpopulations of the virus. The problem was all the others came in and took their place and what made the uh, substantial progress in the HIV and since possible was combination therapies and then monitoring with CD4 T cell counts and viral load. So the cancer kind of analogy, if you will, was that not that the targeted therapies don't work, but we need to understand these cells to figure out what might be the right combination for the right patient at the right time so we can hit the disease at enough angles that actually reduce the overall tumor burden and the populations of these cells that can drive progression later on. That's the entire Obama initiative, the Precision Medicine Initiative, the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. We actually all exist as very unique individuals, and sometimes one size in medicine does not fit all. And that can't be more true than for cancer. Absolutely. Because it's hard to see who's going to survive and who won't, and who's going to be suffering and who won't. Um, but this technique is a way to differentiate who is on the right track, and if they're not, how to get them on a better track by finding other kinds of treatments to surround them. So we're tackling it at various battlefronts. That's right. And I think what's really encouraging about what's happening today is a couple of things. One is oncology is the largest area of pharmaceutical R&D spent today. So there's a huge range of drugs coming out. So physicians really have choices to choose between. Before that really wasn't the case. And now also with the advent of next generation sequencing and ever lower cost, we can start to look at these cells at the genetic level in a way we never could. And that con convergence of technology and the availability of drugs to mix in different combinations is what's very transformative now. This whole possibility of enabling precision medicine at the practical level would not have been even conceivable 10 years ago, but it is now. So I would say it's not here today, but certainly it's not 10 years out either. Right, it's probably coming to an office near you in, within five. That's fantastic. I think precision medicine itself made its debut in the field of oncology, where you can get single tissue diagnoses and then decide what to do with it. And it was there we learned that not all lung cancers are the same, not all prostate cancers are the same. And now we're delving even deeper into the very unique individual and defining what are the groups that behave in a certain way and what do the other individuals look like and to be more specific. So it's quite exciting. So instead of going back to the original diagnosis and labeling it at the source of origin, it started in the lungs or it started in the colon, yeah. right now we're going to be looking at actively you know, what those cells are doing in your body now. Today, exactly. Today. And so it's, it still goes back to the core premise that cancer is a disease of the DNA. I don't think we're changing from that. The question really is, to what degree does the original tumor really represent the patient as they show up today? If we think about a patient's journey, they actually have morphed quite a bit in their disease, and they're probably more different from themselves six months down the road than they might be from another patient altogether. And that's the reality of this disease. And so what these new technologies are allowing us to do is really track them in a meaningful way and almost uh, provide physicians the kind of movie they require to get ahead of this disease versus the static snapshot the traditional biopsy techniques have represented. And when you think about it, you know, the morphing of DNA is, is what triggered the whole event from ha to exactly. happen. And these cells are multiplying out of control. And so, of course, they're going to have more opportunity to morph and differentiate in ways that it's hard to keep up with. But the technique that Epic Science is coming to and what you've been working on is going to help us get ahead of the disease and hopefully, just like HIV, cure cancer in our lifetime. And I think, look, our, our goal is to try to advance the technology as much as possible because in the end of the day, what we have to get past is tremendous expense for singular drugs that maybe extend life only for a month or two or three. 
we have to start thinking about much more durable responses and actually at much more cost-effective price points. Really, so our goal is, you know, cure is always a tremendous ambition, but at the very least, if we can extend life in the way it's done in HIV, um, that is actually a huge step forward. Um, if you think about all the friends and loved ones and so forth who are likely to be impacted by this disease, you know, down the road. Yes, and, and extending the health span so that the quality of life is there when in fact current modes of treatment actually can shorten the lives even further. So just treating alone isn't enough, but being specific and precise about what we're targeting is really going to make the difference. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's really the goal of, of what we're trying to do. We think we're making great progress by their initial days. I, I caution that you know a clear line of sight is not the same as a short distance. Um, but I do feel that the field now has a convergence of technologies, a convergence of attitudes, and I think patients also getting much more active in their care that are going to make, make this trend accelerate in the years to come. That's great. I, I felt listening to your lecture and meeting with you that there's certainly light at the end of the tunnel and that we can actually see it um, beckoning us on instead of the old-fashioned methods of just targeting everyone blanket with you know a shotgun approach, being very specific for each human being so that we can give them the best quality life. Absolutely, that's certainly the hope. Well, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us at the Age Management Medicine Conference. I'm hoping you'll come back next year and we can hear more about the progress that you and your company have made. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure being here. Same here.